Welcome everyone to the second episode, the 30 minutes robotic milking edition. I'm your host, Marcia Andres, dairy science professor and state extension specialist at the University of Minnesota in St. Paul. Today with us, we also have our co-host, Jim Sulfur, dairy extension educator at the St. Cloud Regional Office. Hi, Jim. Hi, Marcia. Hi, Jake, and welcome to all our listeners. Jake, uh, Jake's not here yet. We're going to invite him in a minute, but uh, welcome, Jim, and thank you for uh, in advance for your help later on with the question and answer session. Well, thank so you. So I'll have you kind of go uh, turn your camera off for a minute, and we'll come back later. Thank you, Jim. So as a reminder, for those of you that might be joining this um, as a recording now, uh, if you want to uh, be with us for the live episode next time, please register at z.umn.edu slash 30 M-I-N-R-M. We'll be using a Zoom platform and to ask questions after the producer's overview of their robotic milking operation please type your question or comment in the Q&A box. If you hover your mouse, you find that on the bottom of your screen. Please do not use the chat box. Use the Q&A box. Um, Jim or I will read your question or comment for the producer to respond. I'd like to uh, also use this opportunity to invite you for an event that we are hosting this summer, the Precision Dairy Conference in Bloomington, Minnesota, June 22nd and 23rd, 2021. We'll have a hybrid, at least as of right now, we're planning for a hybrid event with a limited capacity of in-person attendance and then uh, option for a virtual attendance. Registration is open and for details, please go to precisiondairy.umn.edu to get more detail and to register. Today, we're very pleased to have with us Jake from Wisconsin, America's Dairy Land, who is going to be talking to us about their dairy operation uh, in Wisconsin with uh, Ford De Laval robots. And Jake, I now welcome you to come and participate in our discussion. And thank you for being here. All right. Hopefully, we can get the logistics here. There you there are. Yes. So as we discussed earlier, Jake, if you can give us a brief introduction of your uh, farm and so people know uh, kind of what it looks like, I'll help you by moving the pictures no, to the next picture. And when you're done, uh, Jim and I will uh, do the Q&A for you. So oh, take, all it, right. take it over. No problem. I apologize if I like sniffle and like cough and because I've got a cold. So um, you'll have to bear with me, but we'll be okay. So I have a stocking cap on because my head was cold. Um, all right. Well, yep. I'm Jake from Wisconsin, not Jake from State Farm. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an overhead view of our dairy. We milk approximately 250 milking cows right now are milking in the four uh, De Laval robots that we have. Uh, that's an overshot of our feed facilities and our manure pit and everything at the robot facility. Uh, we also milk uh, 78 cows in a tie stall barn across the road. So some of the facilities and some of the um, aspects of the dairy are shared. All the calving uh, and fresh cows are taken care of up at the main robot barn. And then we kind of pick and choose stall barn cows to go to the stall barn um, at some point, basically based on um, times per day that they're milking in the robot and their production. Uh, basically to keep the stall barn full also, but to utilize the robots to the best of their abilities. So it's kind of the overhead, much warmer looking shot than today. All right, I realize this is a little bit uh, more difficult to see, but this is kind of uh, an overshot. It's kind of the best way I could show you guys the inside of our robot barn. Uh, over on the right hand side, uh, that whole pen there right where the mouse is right now is kind of, is our, it's our transition cow pen. So we move cows up there. Uh, approximately two to three weeks before calving from our dry cow facility, which is at a different site, uh, you know, where we switch them over to the transition cow ration. From there, they move into the calving pens, uh, yep, adjacent there, which is just a straw bedded pack. Uh, and then just to the top of that, there's like four little, like I call them sick cow maternity stalls. Uh, we do lock up in some calf uh, hutches for our calves, our newborn calves up to about five days old. Uh, the sick cow maternity cows, we 
Uh, we do lock them up in a headlock twice a day and milk them just with a floor bucket. Uh, it does give us a chance to kind of keep our special needs cows on a closer eye. Uh, and then, you know, they don't have to be thrown in and use up capacity in our robot pens. Um, I guess if you go, we, we do have a cross ventilated barn. It flows air from right to the other way or right to left. Um, the four pens are laid out there. Uh, we do have a guided cow uh, milk first uh, setup. So basically, yeah, where, where Marcia's got the mouse, the robot there, they leave the robot. They go out through a sort lane, just up a little bit there, Marcia, from there. That's the smart. Okay, there you go. Yep. They go out of the robot. They go to the feed lane. And then from the feed lane, they go all the way down to the bottom of the screen to a one-way gate and cross over into the stall area. Yep. And then from there, they go to the court towards the top and they go to a smart selection gate that sorts them. And if they have milking permission, they go into the holding area. And if they don't have milking permission, they go to the feed lane again. Um, the average cow in our barn makes that uh, pass through that smart gate about nine to 10, nine to 11 times a day. And on average, they get, we're at like 2.7 milkings right now. So um, yeah, automatic alley scrapers. And we'll, I'll show you some pictures on that to begin with, or a little bit later. Um, the, where the mouse is right now is just a little utility room off the back of each of the robot rooms. It's where we have the tea dip and chemicals stored. Uh, and then each robot room has two robots and they are raised up in the air uh, at parlor heights. So I think it's like 32 inches and there is a good shot of our robot rooms. Uh, I love my robots raised up in the air. It gives me a chance. I know you're not supposed to like dry cow treat cows in the robot, but it's, it makes it really convenient to, to trap them and then dry cow treat them at that height uh, and then sort them for dry off. So, um, so yeah, we have two of those rooms that look like that. This is a shot of our, one of our feed lanes. Uh, we do have three feed lanes in our barn. We do have an automatic feed pusher. Uh, we have a Juno. Uh, he pushes in each pen eight times a day. Uh, the first six months, we did not have an automatic feed pusher. And when we put in our automatic feed pusher, uh, we basically gained, I think it was like three and a half to four pounds of milk and about two tenths of a visit per day. So it's really helped up our capacity as far as the milking cows and then really driven intakes. Uh, because in our barn, there's nobody there from seven at night till about 6.30 or seven in the morning. So uh, the feed pusher is a vital part. And we, we see it now, like if the feed pusher, if something happens where somebody shuts it off or something, you know, our intakes drop and so does our milk production. So, um, I'm okay. oh, yep, there's, she's pointing at our one-way gates. So because we run a guided flow system, those are our one-way gates. So they're just fingers that hang down and they can't, push back at us, the cow can only go like through it as you're looking at it. Uh, the finger gates do, they do work better than what they call the saloon gates, which would be like saloon doors on an old school tavern. Uh, the cows can figure those out and actually open them and go backwards through where they cannot figure, figure these out. I mean, even the jerseys have a hard time figuring these out. So, um, all right, yep. So the picture on the left is just an overhead shot of uh, my pen two or one of our pens. Uh, we are sand bedded. We have fiberglass uh, freestyle loops. Now, the, the, the interesting thing in that picture is actually like you notice all the cows laying down on the one side and hardly any on the other side. And that is a phenomenon. I do not know what it is. Um, in my barn, the cows tend to all want to lay first in the stalls that they look at the butts of the cows that are eating at the feed lane. And I have no idea, it has nothing to do with wind direction because two of my pens face the other way and they all like to lay in that row of stalls more than the other. Uh, comfort is not an issue, they are all the same stall. It just happens to be, it must be a social thing where they like to see the other cows and not look head to head with the other cows because the row on the left where none are laying is actually a head to head row with another pen that's butt butting up against them. So I, I'm sure there's some cow psychology uh, there, but uh, we have alley scrapers and sand bedding. Yep. So then there on the right-hand side is just how we deal with our sand. Our alley scrapers pull the, the manure into, uh, it's actually just a barn cleaner. You can't quite see it, I don't think, but that, I mean, literally that is a stall barn barn cleaner that runs in there. They're all on timers, uh, kicks on like 15 minutes a day or 15 minutes, four times a day to empty out the sand. Uh, we've been in this barn for 10 years now and we have not replaced the chain yet. So that's a remarkable feat that we are much, we are very happy with the durability that that has provided us. So, 
All right, now this is just a shot that I think is cool, um, not only for guided flow, but just for robots in general. So I took this shot um, of, you know, basically four cows that are all like waiting to, go, waiting to go into the robot, you know, and waiting for that one to get done and exit. Um, you know, if you've got cows that, that are trained well and driven, uh, you will not have a problem getting them into the robot. If you do, there's some outside uh, factor, whether it be feed or a pellet issue or a, an unpleasantness in the milking process that are making them not want to get in the robot. Um, you know, however, when you are in overcrowded situations, you can see these four here that are nose to go in the robot. A more timid cow may hang off to the side, uh, regardless of your, your cow flow setup. But um, I just think it's cool how they all line up like that to, to get in the robot. Um, I think that was your last picture. But before we start the question and answer, Jake, thank you for this overview. And this gives a great idea of what your barn looks like and how you operate it. Remember, we had a discussion recently about what you did with your heifers and what that did to your production. Can you just briefly mention that, please? Yeah. So, for, yep, no problem. So, for the first um, two, eight years, nine years, what I did was I, I really tried to maximize my uh, pounds per robot per day. So my four groups in my barn were literally all different stages of lactation, all different lactations. Um, basically, wherever I could put new fresh heifers, I would put new fresh heifers to balance out how many cows were in each pen, which worked very good from a ro robot productivity standpoint. Um, you know, I could doing that, I could average, you know, I could get over 6,000 pounds a box on all four of them, you know, day in and day out. Uh, the problem I was facing, the more hired, and you, and you can do that. The problem with that is the more hired labor you get. And the reason why is because I, I was doing it before. So I was fetching those heifers twice a day. I was, you know, and it takes, I don't want to say it takes a special person, but like it, it, it takes somebody who knows the, like the repercussions of if you mess up a heifer, what can happen. So like when I did it, I made sure it got done the same way every day. And, you know, those heifers seem to do okay, not great, okay. Um, but then the more I had hired people come and help um, fetch cows, if they would forget that heifer or something like that, you know, and she went 24 hours without being milked, you know, you can crash a heifer pretty fast doing something like that. Uh, basically, what was starting to happen is my 100 to 140 day in milk um, first lactation heifer average had dipped down to almost like 65 to 67 pounds, which in my opinion is horrible. Um, and so we, we really started trying to look for a solution to, okay, what can we do to change that? Um, at that point we had had our, we, we, we had purchased our stall barn. So, you know, one idea was, oh, we're gonna run these heifers, you know, they're only getting 65 pounds in the robots and get milk twice a day or not even, why don't we just take them to the stall barn and milk them twice a day there and make sure there's feed in front of them all the time. And then when we need cows at the robot barn, well, we'll bring them back. Uh, we tried that and it did not work as, I mean, we actually did gain some production on the heifers. You know, our average went from about 65 up to 70 pounds in that window. But then we realized that when we bring those stall barn heifers back to train them in the robot barn, we had initially, I mean, we had basically trained morons. Like they, they taught themselves to be tie stall barn cows in, even if it was only like 60 days or 70 days, like they were, they were worse than they would have been before. So then what we ended up doing was um, I went and toured a different dairy that was very aggressive, a robot dairy that was very aggressive in their heifer fetching. And they had a strictly robot or a heifer robot pen. And so what I did was I went home or I came home and basically emptied all the cows out of that pen and basically started dumping all my new heifers into that pen. Um, and what we've seen in about a little over a year that I've done it is we moved that average of that 100 to 140 day in milk. Uh, average from uh, 65 pounds to 90 pounds. So we upped that by 25 pounds just by having a heifer pen uh, and, and not overcrowding it. We run about 55 to 60. I've had about 62 in it as a peak, um, but it works best at like 57 to 59 where they're not too crowded, but just crowded enough and uh, where they can get their visits through. And uh, it seems like having all the heifers together, their timidness, they don't get bossed around by the old cows as much. And so it, it really seems to, to do that. I, I could get better results if I wasn't so lazy. Uh, if I fetched them, you know, initially, which I did at first, like three and four X a day, but I am not, I, I tried killing myself trying to do that. So, I mean, as far as like being here all the time, 
So what I did was basically I just went back to the twice a day fetching and by undercrowding them, they, it takes them a little bit longer, but they seem to adapt. And I mean, I'm still seeing results, good results uh, on the end. So. Okay. Thank you, Jake. I think we need to move to questions because Sorry. Like, no, we have quite a few. <laughs> Jim, uh, would you like please to come back and join us here? And then we'll start asking questions. Hi, Jim. Hi. Again. So do you want to ask the first question? Sure. Well, the question is related to a retrofit. It, it says, it seems like this is not a retrofit project. What would your comments be about a retrofit? Or can you make comments on design or how you might do that? Um, you know, retrofits, they can be set up good and they can be set up bad. I mean, I was lucky enough that, I mean, we did build from a green site. So we got to lay it out pretty much exactly as we wanted. Um, you know, there are different limitations to each one, you know, I am guided flow, you know, sometimes you can make guided flow work in a retrofit, you just have to have it laid out right and take into some different considerations. Um, you know, free flows seem to be adapting or, you know, they seem to be laying those out a lot better now uh, in, a, in a retrofit. Uh, you just got to remember, you know, I am very partial to guided flow. And, uh, you know, you can definitely make free cow traffic work and I'm not opposed to it. It's just that, you know, you're, you're going to be limited on cow numbers per box and I think uh, pounds per robot per day. Hopefully that answered. I don't wanna be an expert in the area of renovations, so. Right, thank you. And, and you, do you think that is a difference? I think is an advantage, um, retrofits versus new builds? I think Jim and I, in our research, we have seen basically a, a 45-55 ratio, uh, even in our recent one. Um, I didn't mean, statistically pick up any difference in production or anything, but what's, uh, what's your opinion on that? Well, I mean, anytime you can build, you know, completely new, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome. I mean, you can build it exactly how you want it. Um, you know, where a retrofit is, you're going to deal with what you have and some mm -hmm. of the thorns involved with it. Um, right. But I, I realized that, you know, cost is the largest factor in that. Um, and there's a lot of very good retrofit herds now that are coming out of obviously you know six row barns with three row pens uh mm -hmm. free, free cow traffic you know you but you're gonna the nice thing about the new build is you can literally build the barn around the labor that you want right. and how you want to structure that labor um when we built ours i mean that's what it was it's basically i outlined my day and i literally did like a virtual walkthrough of my barn on paper of what i how i wanted my how you do work with labor so as a yep. labor based decision if you will and how you do it okay yep. it looks like we have some more questions coming in so like by order here jim do you want to ask the question about groups here sure how big do you prefer your groups you know you have one robot per pen and why did you do that ultimately and that maybe will tie into a guided mm -hmm. flow discussion about why you selected guided flow so, you know, 10 years ago when we built this, um, there was two types of guided flow barns. There was disasters in guided flow barns, and there was, you know, ones that had promise and, you know, decentness, to, I mean, success rates. Um, so the reason why the 60 cow pens also was, I mean, I maybe would have went to 120 cow pen, but at that time we could not figure out a layout that um, worked with guided flow where it was kind of a one directional for the cows. Um, at that time, the, the two robot pens with guided flow had where the cow was in a holding area, they went into the robot, then they came out of the robot back into the same holding area. Um, a lot of confusion for the cows, it, they got horrible throughput. Um, and so the single box 60 cow pens seemed to work the best. Um, and there was actually in Wisconsin, there was some state laws about, you know, you couldn't cross a manure alley to get access to the robot uh, as a person. And so that presented some limitations too. Now, however, you know, they've made some, some changes. Um, they've got some toll booth designs where the cows, you know, don't get mixed back in with the ones that haven't been milked until they, you know, exit the robot. So, I mean, I am not opposed to 120 cow group. Um, you know, and there's some 180 cow and 240 cow groups that have a toll booth design uh, with kind of the same philosophy as my 60 cow group, just larger group numbers. I mean, I am very partial. I love 60 cow groups from the standpoint of like, I know where the cows are. 
and it's very easy to find a cow in a in a 60 cow group like i mean literally it, less than five minutes and i can find you know any cow in my barn with my eyes not with gps or you know other help mm-hmm. i've got like 56 cow 56 stalls per pen and i'll run up to you know 65 or so um there's another robotic dairy not far from here with got my my exact same pen layout i mean he's not afraid of 67 to 68 with the older style robots okay thank you jake just before the next question jim i just want to clarify i had mentioned earlier that we in our research we find 45 percent yeah 45 percent retrofits and 55 percent new and this has changed more recently to have a larger percentage of new uh, installations or new uh, builds. So, but that's been what our history. So sorry for that, didn't make it very clear. Okay, Jim, there's a question about uh, culling. Maybe we can ask that Yeah, one. well, you know, has your culling criteria changed? Uh, the flat out question is, is utter confirmation your cr- main criteria for culling? But do you just want to comment culling in general since you've went to robots and what is your criteria changed, stayed the yes. same? So the, <clears throat> the very first year that we, um, we were in the robot barn, we ran a 6% call rate. We virtually, I mean, and that was obviously because we had, you know, we, we basically called anything that we didn't think or we, the cows we bought were all in good shape. So, the, I mean, there's reasons why we ran such a low call rate the first year. Um, I've run it as low as 15 in building number years. So, like, when we bought the stall barn, I needed to build some numbers. So, I mean, we just called less. My actually, my number one culling reason is pretty much probably what a lot of dairies culling reason is, and that's repro, you know, not getting a cow pregnant. Um, and then, you know, she trails off in milk and you get rid of her for that reason. I have, I don't want to say virtually no injuries, but I mean, re- like, I mean, my, my incidence of injury in my robot pens is virtually nothing. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the grit from the sand bedding. And then just like, nobody's ever pushing them, like, or moving them, or they're all at their own pace, at their own style, at their own, um, I guess, yeah, pace. So I, I call virtually none for injuries. And oh, back to utter confirmation. Um, you know what? I don't even really worry about it anymore. I mean, there's, I mean, th- I call as many for utter confirmation than I do for injury. Uh, the robots have definitely gotten you know, much, much better as far as being able to attach and deal with, you know, they still don't like super short teats or, you know, especially like a, a rear udder that's higher with short teats, you know, they'll attach, but it's, it's a little bit more difficult. Okay. So a question here about nutrition now and how do you manage your rations so you can drive cows to visit the robot uh, frequently? So we run, and, and from the beginning, I've, I mean, tried to take the simpler aspect of this. So I didn't, I wanted to feed as little, or I guess as little of uh, pellets in the robot as possible. Right now we're averaging about four and three quarter to five pounds uh, of gluten. We feed, we we just feed gluten pellets in the robot every day, um, which basically works out to about, uh, you know, one and a half to two pounds of visit um ish depending on how many times they go a day they always are entitled to something um but we don't push a lot there we started out when we started 10 years ago you know we went the whole route of you know you need a hard good pellet um you know an expensive pellet (laughs) um and then you know 2016 15 16 17 proved us a lot of other things uh other than the, the gluten that we feed in the robot at a very low rate uh we feed a one batch tmr to the whole barn um you know, we're pretty much most of the energy other than that five or six pounds of gluten uh, or that, yeah, that five pound of gluten, you know, we take into effect, but it, it's pretty simple. Okay. Did you see much of a difference in production per robot or per cow when you switched from that more expensive pallet to dust feeding uh, corn gluten or not? <laughs> um, no, that okay. was what kind of amazed us. Good like, to know. Our biggest fear was the fines <laughs> and the gluten. Um, so you do have to make sure you have decent gluten. It can have some fines in our robots, but it can't have a lot because the more pounds and then the more pounds you would try to push of that, they don't like the fines. So you have to be a little bit careful and then the logistics and the flex augers and stuff. Um, but, you know, there's guys feeding even more gluten than that. I know there's free flow guys pushing a lot of gluten. Um, you know, gluten is not as cheap as what it used to be, but it's still cheaper than a pellet. So, I mean, I'm not on my gluten horse here. I mean, the pellets still have very good success. It's just, I, I'm okay with gluten. Okay. Thank you. Jim, next question. 
Yeah. Do you have any other technologies to go along with your robots? You had mentioned a Juno feed pushers, but do you have any other sensors or cameras or any of those systems that help you? Um, actually, I'm pretty low key. I used to run activity, um, but 30% of my cows were never showing activity. So about three or four years, well, it was probably about when, you know, BST got taken away from us probably, you know, four years ago or, you know, something like that. Uh, I went to a, a full double off sync program, um, changed, I mean, I, I go full on shots and basically don't even watch for any active heats. Um, you know, there are definitely systems though out there right now that are tripping my trigger that weren't around 10 years ago. Uh, you know, some of the, with rumination and activity. And I mean, those, I haven't thrown them out the window yet as far as not investing in those. Um, we have cameras, but I don't have cameras like on my calving pens or um, anything like that. Because when I leave here, I try to disconnect a little bit other than the robots calling me once in a while. Um, just because otherwise I'm on my phone enough. I don't need to be checking my cameras all the time. So unless you guys think of, know of anything that I have that I'm not thinking of, but otherwise I'm. <laughs> wow. There's so much out there, Jake, but just to follow up to this herd manager software, do you use that? Oh, I use the Dell Pro software that comes with my robots. Yep. So, okay. and I, I mean, that is my only herd management software. So yeah, I do use that religiously. And, okay, good. Jim. You know what your maintenance costs are, Jake, off the top of your head, and you can include chemicals or not, but just okay. kind of clarify maintenance and then your other um, consumables. Do you know those costs? So I was trying to get a hold of uh, my supplier because usually every year I try to go through every all the statements and like invoice it or basically like separate out all the maintenance versus chemicals. And of course, like she was out of the office. So I, I didn't get it. So what I did was I, I basically took off my profit and loss statement um, like my, they do have like robot repairs and supplies, like as one big thing. And last year I ran about 11,500, which per box, which I would say is a little bit on the higher side for me. I probably on average float from about that, probably around that 10,000, I would say is probably more closer to my average over the last 10 years. So, you know, and that, that includes everything consumables, you know, inflations, chemicals, heat dip, um, repairs and maintenance kits, everything. So just to clarify, Jake, do you do a lot of your own repairs or do you call dealers up for a lot of things or can you comment? Cause it seems like that would make a big difference. I do a lot of my own like troubleshooting. Um, and I'll do basic, um, simple stuff, but like, I don't do my, I don't put in my own maintenance kits. I have them come and do that. Cause then they graph everything and make sure everything's okay there. Um, I change my own inflations. Um, you know, I, I would say for the most part, I maybe do, oh, I would say maybe five to 10% of the labor of the total labor that gets put into the robots. So, I mean. Okay. So we are down to about two minutes left, Jake, and we have a couple of questions that relate to milk quality. So how do you manage milk quality? Do we have a lot of cases of clinical mastitis? So we can just a brief overview of how you manage mastitis and other health. Okay, I'll try this. So the herd management software triggers me with cows that might have issues. Um, I don't have a number in front of me right now as far as like our cases of clinical mastitis. Um, you know, right now we've got, you know, one in our sick pen out of the 330 that are milking. Um, you know, we the key with milk quality in a robot barn is stall maintenance. Uh, you, you don't have your eyes and ears out there. You know, you can't groom a stall as often as what you do in a freestall barn. Um, you know, so it really comes down to the, like the most important job in our barn is the guy who goes through and does stall maintenance and it needs to be done religiously and it needs to be done well. And if you slack on that area, you're going to, you know, suffer in milk quality. I mean, I'm not embarrassed about our milk quality, but it's not, I mean, it can, it can definitely be better. Like, um, right now we're running about 170,000 somatic cell. Um, you know, we've been as high as a few years ago, you know, 300. Um, I've been as low as 140, but 140 has been about as low as I've been. When we moved into this barn from our old barn, we were at like 275 in the old barn. So we did, we, we, we did considerably better, I guess. Okay. So you still meant, as you briefly mentioned, how often you, uh, bad and how, how do you handle stall maintenance? 
So we, we actually put in new sand once a week and once then week. twice a day we go through with a shovel and basically level stalls and throw out uh, manure or milk or, you know, things like that. Leaking milk, I think, is a bigger issue in a robot barn, just from the stand, especially a stall or a, a sand stall robot barn, because of they, you know, there's nothing to get them up other than the fact that they want to go eat. So, you know, if they're comfortable and they're laying there and they're a big old lazy cow and they don't want to get up, like they'll just lay there and leak, leak milk in the stalls. Okay. So, thank you so much. Uh, we're out of time, <laughs> and I think we answered all the questions we had in the Q and A. And we're so pleased to have you here today, Jake, joining us uh, in this. Uh, I know you, you had to rearrange, kind of make sure we're working in your schedule. So we're very appreciative of having you here. No problem. Um, so thank you all of you to the who attended live uh, or maybe might be watching the recording, our second episode of 30 Minutes Robotic Milking Edition. And I'd like to see you all again uh, for episode number three on March 18, where we'll have a dairy with 36 robots, uh, 36 Lely robots. So anyway, join us for next time. And again, thank you, everyone. And uh, have a great rest of the week. Yeah, thank you.